Hi, everybody. Welcome back to CS13, CSE 1322. Um, today, we are going to cover module number four, um, which is the beginning of graphics and GUI programming, which is at least very different than what we've been doing in module three, which if I had to guess, you're all sick of module three by now. Um, but before we get started with this, I'm just going to go over a couple of logistical things to get you reacquainted to where we are. Um, so the first thing is that uh, hopefully you guys are working on quiz number four. Uh, quiz number four has a due date of October the 4th, which is next Sunday, this coming Sunday specifically. Um, so make sure that you get that knocked out in the near future. Um, in addition to that, uh, you guys uh, probably have a lab and a uh, assignment that you're probably working on related to um, inheritance and um, um, overwriting of methods and stuff like that. Um, I think you guys are doing a calculator this week. And then I think next week you're going to actually implement the GUI on top of that calculator, which is going to be pretty fun. So um, those are those things. The other thing I will say is that this is week number seven. And if you are good at math, you will quickly realize that means we are halfway there. Yay! Um, so congratulations. Pat yourselves on the back. You have made it halfway through the semester. Um, and then the final comment that I have is that test number one, you guys are, are still waiting on your grades. Um, I believe they are almost all graded at this point, so I would expect that the grades for those will be posted probably Tuesday of this week. So if not Tuesday, they'll certainly be there Wednesday. All right, well, those are all of my logistical updates. Um, so without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get started on module number four. So the first question that you might have is, what is a GUI and why are we talking about it? So GUI stands for Graphical User Interface, which is probably something you've heard of before, and it is a replacement or a different way of doing interaction with users. So way up until the 70s, basically, every time that you uh, had a computer and uh, somebody was running any kind of interaction with it, they were looking at something very like this output window, which is what we've been looking at this entire time. You might remember the silly little guessing game that we wrote in the first week. So I'm going to enter in my guess, and my guess is going to be the number six. And it says, you guessed correctly. <laughs> OK, well, that was very exciting. Um, but this style of interaction where it is just plain text and the user types in their answer and then it either says yes or no or asks them for more information, I mean, there's still a place for that in the world, but there is a limited place for that in the world, if we're being honest. Most everybody nowadays expects a graphical user interface. And interestingly enough, if we actually look at this window, I'm really looking at a graphical user interface. It's just that this text area that I've been dealing with is only over in one corner. So of course, what you're looking at here is Chrome. And Chrome is a graphical user interface. Um, it allows you to type in a URL up here, and then it shows you the web page, as you are well aware. Um, and then inside of that, we have elements of a graphical user interface, like we have menus that I can expand and I can retract over here. They're only visible when I want them to be visible. Um, we can move around the different windows and make them bigger or smaller, depending on what my needs might be. And I can go to completely different screens by you know, clicking around in a menu. I can go back to my home screen, or I can go back somewhere else. So the idea of a GUI is effectively to take what people are expecting nowadays and making it so that everything is in a pleasing way, so that it's easy for the user to interact with the program. Um, so you're going to be writing some graphical code this week uh, where you're going to do a little bit of drawing some stuff on the screen. You're also going to do a little bit of laying out a UI for somebody to interact with. Um, you will notice that the programming style ends up being a little bit different when you're dealing with a UI where you're asking the user to interact. So up until now, we have printed out, hey, give me a number. And then we expect the user to give us a number. And there's really nothing else the user can do except to give us a number, and we are going to wait there forever. But if you think about it in a GUI, that's really not how it works at all. I can come up here, and I can open a new tab. And then I can start loading a page in here. So um, there's the CCSE Kennesaw. But while that's loading, I can go back over here, and I can find one of my replets, and I can run that little guessing game again. And I can have multiple different things going on in different places, and I can be interacting with them in a different way. It's all based on what I'm doing as a user. The user is deciding which part of my code is running next. When I click here, I ask for it to do one thing. When I click here, I'm asking for it to do another thing. When I click here, and your entire computer is like that, right? You can pull up the, the volume button down here, or you can change you know, anything. Everything reacts to the user's clicks. 
So that's a very different way of coding because you don't just say, ask for a number, and now you wait forever until they ask for a number. What you're instead going to say is, if they press this button, here's what I want to happen. If they click on this menu, here's what I want to happen. So it's all event driven. When they do an event, you're going to say, I'm going to go do this one thing in response. All right. So why do we use GUIs? Well, I mean, the simple answer is it's just what people expect at this point. But the honest answer and the bigger answer is because it allows us to organize the information in a much more useful way, such that people can see it and interact with it in a very natural way. Ideally, this, the, the discipline of user interface design or human computer interaction, HCI, which that is an entire discipline of computer science. You can take classes on that and you will study um, how people interact with a computer and what is natural and what's not natural. Um, there's entire groups of people in each of the large software engineering companies that deal with the user interface and decide what's going to work for people and what doesn't. And I mean, honestly, if you think about all the programs that you use in your life, there are some of them that you stop using them because they're pretty awful. And you expect it to work one way and it really doesn't and you end up having to fight with it constantly. And eventually you're just going to move on and find something else that's easier to work with. So UI is really, really important. So when you're building something, you need to think to yourself, how would I want to use it? It's really easy to have your developer hat on and you're over there coding and you're getting your stuff done and you're like, well, it works. I mean, all they have to do is click this menu and then this, go to the submenu and then click the submenu and then open a window, type in this random hexadecimal code and hit submit. Why is that so hard? Well, that's not intuitive to the average person. So people are not going to love your, your, um, your, uh, your application. So real important that you think through what would be useful for somebody. And you have to kind of picture, you know, the simplest interface that you can get. Today, a lot of UIs are designed in what's called material design, which is to try and translate things that exist in the real world, like pieces of paper, and then make it so that when you pull up the piece of paper, you can see the text on it. And it's natural, like it scrolls and it, it works in the same way. And if you want to move to the next page, you do some kind of a gesture, you know, so that it feels natural and you don't have to explain to somebody how to use the GUI. All right. So the next topic here is that there is a difference between front end and back end coding. And we're going to talk about that for just a second here. So everything you've done so far, the front end and the back end is really the same code. You ask the user for a number and you sit there and you wait until the end of time for them to type in a number. But once you start needing to separate the two things such that you have the ability for the user to only press things when the user wants to press things, then you have to have a GUI that is waiting for them to do stuff. Well, that's very different than what you might need in your code on the back end that may be doing some kind of transactions. So if we think about a bank, which you guys did a lab a couple of weeks ago where you had to calculate interest. And one of the questions that a couple of people came to us with is, well, when is the interest actually calculated and who's really calculating the interest? And really what they were telling us there is that logically in their mind, it didn't make sense that you're writing this GUI program where there's a menu and you can say, make a deposit, make a withdrawal. When does the interest ever get calculated? It doesn't make sense. Somebody would have to say, calculate interest on this account now. What would instead happen is that there's some background process that once a month it would wake up and it would go ahead and calculate all the interest on all of the accounts and update all of the accounts automatically without the GUI, the front end, having to have that. So this is the concept of separating two parts of your application. In some cases, it'll be separated into three. And I can give you a, an example that I had from a previous company. So um, where I last worked, there was an inventory system and we had to keep track of all of the servers in our data centers, which was thousands and thousands of servers. So Obviously, you're going to need some kind of a database or some kind of storage area to store all of those, the information about all of those computers, which that's great. That's going to be your back end. And it will have to have the ability to update information about a computer or get information about a computer or note that the computer has been turned on or off or disposed of or it's broken or it's caught on fire or whatever's happened to it. And then separately, there needs to be a front end where people can go and actually enter, enter information about new servers that are coming up online or servers that are being deprovisioned or things that they have done an upgrade on or added an IP to or whatever it is that they may have done to it. So the front end in that case was a web application. They went to a URL and then they got an application in a web browser. Um, and the back end, as I mentioned, was a bunch of code which interacted with the database to keep track of all the inf info. But in that case, the weirdness was that there was more than one front end. 
So there's the concept that somebody might need to come and manually type in information about a computer, but there was also the concept that we had a lot of automation that added machines and removed machines when, when necessary. So for example, if you have an application and there's going to be a surge of users, think about somebody like a Ticketmaster, for example. When they sell tickets to a big concert, which of course concerts are not working right now, but let's pretend that they are. When they sell tickets to a big concert, they're going to get a huge number of people who are going to hit them all at once. And so just before that happens, ideally in their data center, they're going to spin up a lot more servers to handle all of that load. And then as soon as it's over and done with, as soon as all the tickets are sold, we're going to automatically compress back down to a smaller number of servers. Well, that means that in the inventory system, you're not going to have somebody manually entering all those in the UI because it's an automated process. It's spun up and it's spun down automatically. So there's going to be some other application that's going to need to reach in and tell the back end that a bunch of servers have appeared or disappeared. And so that's where you're going to get the idea of a middleware. A middleware is an interface between the back end and the front end. And you're very commonly going to get this called, you're going to hear this called as an API layer, which is a a set of programming interfaces that you are making public from the back end that the front end will consume, meaning that the front end will write code against those APIs in order to call them and ask them to do something. But there may be more than one front end that's doing that. So there may be this automated one that's chugging through and it's making and that removing machines simultaneously to you may have two or three users on the website who are adding and removing stuff. So. The concepts were there's the back end, which really doesn't care about the user. It only cares about the data. How do you put the data in the database? How do you get the data out of the database? Are there any automated processes that need to happen on the data that run in the background? That's the work of the back end. The work of the front end is purely to give the best interface for a user. And then the front end is going to tell the back end what it is that the user is trying to do. So the way that it tells that in some cases is that there's a middleware in between the two of them where the front end tells the middleware and the middleware tells the back end. And you might say, well, why do you need this extra layer of indirection? Because the way that a user interacts with something and the way that the back end interacts with something are usually quite different. So you may need something that translates between the two. Think of the middleware as a translator. If you were speaking to somebody in a different language, then you need a translator in the middle that says how to talk between the two. The middleware also gives the ability for there to be more than one front end, which is quite common. As a matter of fact, very strangely, I'm teaching these slides out of Google Slides. And there is a front end in Google Slides, and I have menus up here where I can click on things, and I can go into boxes, and I can press buttons on menus, and I can slide, move between the slides. But on my phone, I can pull up that exact same slide presentation and I get a very different interface on here because my phone is a much smaller device. So on my phone, I don't get the ability to do all the same things that I can do up here. I get a much simplified one. So these are two examples of two different front ends. There's a fully fleshed out web front end, and then there's a smaller mobile front end that allows me to do the things that I'm most likely going to need to do on a mobile front end, but it's not encumbered by all these buttons because on a screen of this size, I can't get to every single button. They'd be tiny. It would be awful trying to do that. So I don't want to have a million buttons on there. I just want something very basic. So a tenant of GUI design is that you present to the user only the things that they need at that given moment. It should be a very simplified view that makes sense in their head and allows them to do things naturally. That may be very, very different than the back end, which is dealing with things quite often in a very unnatural way from the perspective of a user, because what it cares about and what the front end care about can be two radically different things. So hopefully that makes sense between the two. Um, all right, so let's talk about some common parts of a UI. So on the right hand side here, we have a calculator and you're, you've all seen this. And I, I guess there's one here on the computer that looks a little bit different. I took that screenshot from a Chromebook and this one is from a Windows machine, but both of these have a bunch of things in common. So the numbers are laid out in a logical way. And interestingly enough, pretty much all calculators put the number one at the bottom left and then work their way up to nine, which is actually weirdly the opposite of how telephones do it. If you ever look at a telephone, you'll notice that one is here and then two, three, four, five, six. At some point in the past, somebody said that this made a lot of sense and then it's a legacy thing. If you had 
I don't know if you've ever seen a movie where somebody has like one of the old fashioned calculators on their desk and they're like, people have learned to type on calculators based on the fact that the number one is in the bottom left corner. If you change it suddenly, people will have a really hard time adjusting. So there is a convention that everybody uses that the number one is at the bottom. But weirdly in phones, we decided to put it at the top. So my point here is you do what's natural and what is expected, even if it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Hmm. All right, so you'll notice that the buttons here are laid out in what's called a grid layout. And what that means is it's, it's laid out logically column by column. And even if I stretch and shrink this window, you can see that they don't change their positions. It would be very bad in a UI if as I shrink, the buttons changed where I was going. Um, you'll see that sometimes, like up here, all of these buttons that exist inside this browser window, if I shrink down the browser window, I can make them move around to some extent. And actually it tries to be very careful about what it wants to keep on my screen versus what it will happily hide off of my screen. Um, I'm just gonna close these out because I'm done with those. So there is some thought about where buttons are and when they move, um, and that's something you have to do. But a grid layout is a very common layout where things are just laid out pretty much in rows and in columns this seems relatively natural to most people. So you'll see a grid. It's sometimes also called a table. If you think about like Excel or a spreadsheet program of some form, you're used to seeing things laid out in a grid. And that's why they're so popular. People frequently put information into Excel spreadsheets because it's laid out in a nice logical fashion. Um, another option is that you might have a tree and most menus end up being a tree. So like for here, I have an initial menu and then I can drill into a child or a branch of that tree. And then from there, I can go into another branch of that tree and I can get to some other information. So this is sometimes called an accordion. It's sometimes called a tree. It's sometimes just called a menu, but these are all examples of layouts that you will use when you're putting information on your screen. The last one that, that's mentioned here is cards. And you'll see this a lot today. Um, a lot of UIs nowadays have cards for different things. Um, and so cards are just a way that you can organize information where you have more than one of them on a screen. If you think about your, if you have any kind of a note program that you use, like OneNote from Microsoft, or if you're using Google Keep, or if you're using um, any other note keeping program, you'll tend to see the notes as individual cards inside the UI, and then you'll move around inside of there to move things around. All right, and then the users interact with the GUI through a number of different things. So we've already seen menus, that's up there. They may have buttons, so I can highlight this and I can make it bold by clicking on a button. So this is a button that's up there. Um, they may have selection lists where they're choosing from something. So if I come here, these are all the different fonts that are supported. And so I would choose which one I want. That's a selection list. Radio buttons are a special kind of selection list. They only let you select one thing, whereas check boxes are a different kind, which allow you to select more than one thing. And depending on the circumstance, sometimes you need one, sometimes you need the other. A date picker is a common thing. So that basically is going to render some kind of calendar and allow me to choose a time and or a date. A file chooser is a similar idea, except it allows me to, um, you know, like open up a new file. Um, it's going to give me a list of all of the folders and allow me to select a particular folder that I wanted and go from there. Um, labels are simply just text that's on the screen. So like, if it's not a button, it's probably just text on the screen. And I don't see a good example of that here because almost everything on the screen is a button in one way or another. Um, yeah, but if it's just plain text, it's, it's a label. Um, you may have knobs and sliders. These are just ways of adjusting something. Um, typically when you're dealing with a volume, you're going to have a slider of some form, which allows you to select up or down what number you want. And that makes my, that makes that ding in my ears, which is not great. Um, links, this is a link here, and you know that anytime it's underlined, you're used, net, you're used to the fact that that's going to bring you somewhere else. Um, and then you might have a progress bar, which you're familiar with those as well when you try to open up some piece of software or you're opening up your, uh, your game system and it suddenly decides it has to apply a update and you're like, oh, good Lord. Um, so the, the progress bar shows you how long. So these are different UI elements that you might have to deal with um, as you are using your uh, UI or as you're designing your UI, which is what we're gonna do. Um, all right, so let's uh, let's talk about how we lay things out. So 
clearly in this UI that we're looking at here, there is a decision that this file menu is going to be right here in the top left corner. It's not all the way up in the very top left corner, but it's, it's pretty close to the top left corner. And then the edit button is going to be next to that and so on. So somebody made a decision as to exactly where each of these things are. Now, to be clear, as I mentioned, if I shrink and I grow the window, sometimes those things will move um, related to each other. They'll move in proportion to each other effectively. But you will always specify where things are using a grid system um, with two coordinates. So for example, um, both Java and C Sharp use the same coordinate system. The top left corner of the window, wherever that may be, all the way up in here in the corner, is going to be position 0, 0. The bottom right corner is going to be the highest number, comma, the highest number. And you might say, why are you being vague about that? Um, well, because it depends on how big the screen is and what font size you're using and what resolution you have as to exactly how big this is. Um, so you, you will specify how big you want your window um, in pixels. 600 pixels is a relatively small amount in a high resolution screen. But if you're on a lower resolution screen, 600 may be the full size of the screen. Um, so when you set up a computer, at some point you had to choose the resolution of the screen. And that's usually dependent on your monitor as to how far you can go in that. Um, I don't know what resolution this is at, but it's it's probably relatively high, probably like 1900 by 700, give or take. It may be something more than that. So you're going to specify a number. All right, so how do you how would you put something right here where this dot is? Well, you would specify the first number, which is it gets bigger as you go along this axis, the x axis. Um, that's the first number. So according to this, this is 75 pixels away from the edge. And then you specify the second number, which gets bigger as you go further down the window. And in this case, we're saying this is 60 pixels from the top. So 75 over, 60 down gives you that spot. Whereas 350 over, 250 down would get you to this spot, and so on and so forth. So anytime you're putting something on the screen, you're going to need a two-digit number. Um, sorry, a, two, a set of two digits, the X coordinate and a Y coordinate. If we were going to draw a line from here to here, I would specify that the line will begin at 7560, which is two digits, and then I would say it ends at 350, 250, which is there, and that would have the effect of drawing a line down here. I do not want to pick that up. I thought that I was drawing. I am totally not drawing. There we go. That would draw a line <laughs> that would be much straighter than that, but it would draw a line somewhere along this, this general place. All right. So that is how we deal with um, positions on the screen. And OK, good. Got rid of the eraser. Go away. Ah, I have made terrible decisions. All right. <laughs> now I don't have access to. Yeah, we're going to pause for a moment. OK. I have figured out how to get my mouse back. All right. So the next thing we're going to talk about is colors. Um, when you're designing UI, you will use colors in different places. Colors are very, very um, useful for giving information to people or catching people's attention. If you think about every graph you've ever looked at, there's probably multiple colors on the graph. Why? Because it allows you to convey information in addition to the height of the bars or the size of the pie slices or whatever else. Um, so color is very useful in a UI. Um, it also allows you to see things that you're allowed to do and things that you're not allowed to do. It's quite common that if something is not possible, it's grayed out so that it, you know that you can't actually do that right now. So how do you go about defining colors? Well, to most computer systems, colors are going to be defined using what's called RGB, um, which is red, green, and blue. And in each one of those cases, you're going to specify a hexadecimal value. Um, so let's talk for just a moment about hexadecimal in case that's not something that you've used recently or something that maybe you've never heard of. Um, so everything that we do today when we talk about numbers, we deal in decimal 10. Um, why? Because, well, we were born with 10 fingers, most of us. So for whatever reason, we decided that 10 was the magical number. What I mean by that is if you're counting, you're going to start off with the number 1, then go to 2, then 3, then 4, then 5, and all the way up until you get to 8 and then 9. Once you get to 9, if you need another number, you now need two digits. You increment the next number to a 1, and you go back to 0 on the second number. 
So then you go one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And when you get to 19, you add one more to the first number, which brings you to 20 and reset back to zero. So you're dealing with a system where there are 10 digits, zero through nine. And every time you reach nine, if you need another number, you have to increment the next digit over. That's how regular numbers work. How hexadecimal numbers work is pretty much the same thing, except there are 16. You know, like you were born with 16 fingers, because that makes sense. But anyway, so in hexadecimal, the numbers are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And then for the number 10, as we would know it, that's represented by the letter A. 11 is represented as B. 12 is represented as C. 13 is D. 14 is E. And 15 is F. Once you get past F, if you need to go to 16, then you would represent that as a 1 followed by a 0 because you go back to the beginning again. So 1, 0 in hexadecimal is 16. 1, 1 in hexadecimal is 17. And then all the way up to 1, F, at which point you move on to the next letter, which is 2, 0. So if we take a look at here, any number in decimal that is lower than 9 is the same in hexadecimal. So if you're dealing with 7, it is 7 in hexadecimal. It only starts getting screwy once you get to the number 10. So 10 in decimal comes out to A, 11 is B, and all the way up to 16, which is F. And then as I say, that's as big as you can do with a single digit. So now you need two digits to represent the next biggest number. So 17 comes out to um, 1, 0. Okay. So I noticed that there was a typo on that slide, which is why I paused and I'm back. Um, I apologize. Uh, this a moment ago said something slightly different, which was incorrect. Um, F is indeed 15, not 16, as it recently moment, a moment ago said. So I'm going to go through that example one more time. So if you are at F, which is the last single digit you can have, um, which is the representation of decimal 15, and you want to add one more to it, then you're going to start a second digit, which is going to be a 1, and you're going to reset the other digit back to 0. So the number 1, 0 is 16 in decimal, uh, whereas 17 is 1, 1. Um, the rest of the slide was correct. So uh, 26 is 1A. That's the, um, you're getting into the letters again. So that is effectively a 16 plus a 10, and that's why you get 26. Um, and that would go all the way up to a 16 plus a 15, which is obviously 31. And then you would move on to 2, 0, and so on. If you go all the way up to FF, which is the biggest thing you can represent with two hexadecimal characters, you're at the number 255, which is very relevant. So hexadecimal is a more efficient way of writing bigger numbers because you can do it with less numbers. That's part of the reason for uh, using this. But FF is something that you're going to become very familiar with because it means 255, which is the highest value you can set for either red, green, or blue. So when you're dealing with a hexadecimal value, and this is useful if you ever do any web UI, stuff in rating HTML, all the colors are going to be specified over here in this way. Um, you're always going to give a set of three numbers that are each two hexadecimal values that specify how much of each of the three colors you want. So the first color is going to be red. You will always remember it as RGB, which will tell you it is red, then green, then blue. That is an order you just have to memorize. It is always going to be stated as RGB. So if you wanted the color red, you would specify all the red is turned on, none of the green is turned on, and none of the blue is turned on, and that gives you pure red, which looks like this number right here, or this color right here in the middle. If you're wanting green, then you would say no red, all the green, none of the blue. And likewise, if you want blue, it's no red, no green, and all of the blue. And then you can mix colors. So if you want yellow, um, you're going to turn on all of the red and all of the green, and that gives you yellow. If you're wanting purple, you're going to turn on all the red and all of the blue, because that's how you make purple. I will point out that if you are somebody who deals with paint, and you're thinking, I'm sorry, you make yellow by doing what now? Yes, it's different for paint than it is for light. These numbers represent how you do it with light. So if you want to make white light, the way you do it is you turn on all the red, all the green, and all the blue, and that will give you white light. Um, if you want black, you turn off all the red, all the green, and all the blue, and the absence of light gives you black. So 
um, just be aware of that because this is quite different in colors. There is no way that you can make white paint by mixing red, green, and blue paint. That's not how that works. So you're dealing purely in light, so remember that. Um, so over on the right here, here's just uh, how you would get the different values that represent different shades of red. Um, there are millions of these charts on the web, so you're basically just going to Google the number, but you can also play with it a little bit. So you can see that like these pinkish hues at the top of the red chart are made up by all the red being turned on and then part of the green and blue being turned on. Um, and just depending on how much of it you turn on and what proportions you get, that gets you closer and closer to a pure red. And then likewise on the other side, you're just turning off more and more of the red until there's no red, at which point you end up with black. So that's how you get darker reds. You just turn down the amount of red light you turn on. All right, so that's how you do colors. Um, so hexadecimal, two digits. FF represents 255, which is the most that you can specify for how much of each light you want turned on. Um, and there you go. Look up a chart if you're having a hard time figuring out how to make a particular color. There's lots of them online. All right, so that brings us to the end of the, um, the general ideas. Let's actually talk about how we're going to do this in each of the languages. So I'm going to start talking about Java, and then I'm going to talk about C Sharp for just a moment. So over in IntelliJ, you're going to need to do a little bit of additional work in order to be able to draw and do these Java FX, which is the name of the library that we're going to be using for all of the graphics and all of the UI work. So Java FX is a library that provides you with the ability to do all the windowing across platforms. And what I mean by that is it works in Windows, it works in Mac, it works on Android, it works everywhere that you can run Java. Um, that's an important detail because the way that windowing is done is quite different in each one of those operating systems. So by comparison, you're going to find that a lot of the work that we do in C Sharp is just going to be a lot easier, and that's partially because for C Sharp it's running in Windows. So there is a predefined set of how the windows work and they can code specifically to that. Whereas in Java, they're having to deal with the fact that you might be on an Android phone or you might be on a Windows machine and those work quite differently from a graphical standpoint. All right, so you're first going to need to install a uh, library. So as you probably know, the Java development kit is what's running on the, um, the bottom end that is actually doing the, um, the running of um, Java when you're executing stuff. Um, so the Java development kit that you're going to need is a particular one. It is version 13 of the Zulu build. At the moment, there is up to version 15, but you very specifically want to get version 13. So the link that you need is right here on the slides. It's also posted, um, and there's a video showing you how to do this exact thing on the FYE site, um, on CCSE um, slash FYE. And I believe it's underneath resources, and I think it's about halfway down. Yes, there we go. Um, if your language is Java, you'll need to install, um, for 13.22, install the Java FX plugin by watching this video. So that video very much steps you through what I'm showing you here. Um, so you click this link, you're going to download it, you're going to unzip it in a particular directory, and then when you open IntelliJ to actually specify that you want a Java FX module or um, program, you're going to specify that you want to use that particular JDK. Um, so. Let's show you how that's going to work. So here I am. This is IntelliJ. I'm going to say it is a new project. And up until now, you've been clicking Java, and you've just been basic Java. But we're instead going to check, we're going to click Java FX. And then under the program S project SDK, you may have more than one option in here. But the very specific one that you need to select is 13 Java version 13.04, which is the one that you just installed. If it's not there, you're going to hit Add JDK, and you're going to dig around until you find where you put it. And off the top of my head, I don't know if I even remember where I put it, but I think it is on my desktop, which is under users. Um, yeah, there it is. Um, so that's what you downloaded in the previous step from that link that's on the slide. And this is the directory that you would choose. You would hit OK, and now magically that will appear as one of your options. So you selected Java FX. You chose the correct SDK. If you don't do that, it will not work. And to be clear, Java FX will appear as an option even if the SDK is not there. So if you do not have that exact thing as an option, you have not done the other step, and that's why it's not working. All right, and then I'm going to hit Next. It's going to ask me for a, um, a name for my project. We're going to call this Lecture 12, I guess. And then Java is going to, or a 
IntelliJ is going to dig around for just a moment, and then it's eventually going to give me a new project. If I expand out my source, you're going to notice that it gives you a little basic um, window. And inside of that window, it's going to do a hello world. If I hit build on this project, and then I come back and I say run, what's going to happen after it's done with its build, which takes just a second, I'm going to get a little hello world window. If you do not get that window, you are not. it's not going to work. You need to go back and do the SDK thing, and you need to keep fighting that until you get the hello world window, because there's no point in coding unless you can see that hello world window. So super important that you do that step before you go any further. All right, so cool, we have the hello world window, and they do give you a nice little bit of um, code here. You can start to see that you could obviously set the title, that's where that is, and you could specify the height. Um, so that window that we were looking at apparently is 300 by 275. All right, in C Sharp, I'm gonna jump over into Visual Studio. Um, I don't have to install anything new. If I have Visual Studio installed, I'm going to say new project. And then in the list of what type of new projects, I'm going to scroll down until I find um, Windows Forms app.net framework. All right, so very specifically, that is what you must choose. And you're going to hit next. And then again, it's going to ask you, this is going to be lecture 12. And great. And likewise, over in C Sharp, once it is through doing its thing, you are going to end up with a little form that looks like that. And if I hit build, and then I hit run, I'm going to get a window that should say form one like that and have nothing else in it. It doesn't say hello world, it says form one. All right, if you don't get that, something's wrong and you need to debug that until you get to that point. So that's the starting point in both of the languages. Now let's actually talk about what it is that we're going to do. So I'm going to talk first about Java, and then I'm going to switch over and talk a little bit about C Sharp. You will notice that throughout this lecture, every time I do the C Sharp examples, it's going to be way easier because C Sharp does a lot of the work for you. In Java, you're actually going to write the code most of the time. In C Sharp, you're going to drag and drop things most of the time. So the C Sharp examples are going to be easier. All right, so back to Java. In Java, there is a concept of a stage. They want you to think about a performance theater where you would have a stage that actors act on. The stage is made up of different scenes. Only one scene is visible at any given time, but there are probably many scenes in a play. So you might have a scene where it's you know, a house, and then a moment later you might have a scene where they're in a bar, and then a moment later you might have another scene where they're in a field. And each of those scenes are going to look very different, and you may you will program all of the scenes ahead of time, and then whenever you're ready for it, you will say stage show scene one and then poof, the stage will magically become scene one. Inside of the stage, I'm sorry, inside of the scene, you will then have a layout that specifies where everything is. This is where the metaphor kind of gets a bit goofy. So I mentioned before that often we deal with grids and uh, tables and stuff like that. And we looked at the little calculator app and I said, this is a grid. So typically you're going to use either a grid pane or a tile pane, which means that they're stacked on top of each other or next to each other as tiles, or a tab pane, which is where you have more than one tab inside of a window like up here, or a scroll pane, which allows you to scroll, obviously, horizontal boxes and vertical boxes, and those are very common ones. A horizontal box would be something like this, where you have a bunch of buttons that are just in a row in one horizontal row. A vertical box would be something like this, where you have a bunch of buttons that are in a vertical row. So you will lay out the scene using one of those layouts, most likely. Then inside of each of those layouts, you're going to put the actual things that you want to put, which might be labels, which are text items, or a canvas if you're going to go drawing, or maybe it's a table or a text area or radio buttons or any of the other things that we talked about. And it's a long list of what could be in there. So the order is you have a stage, which is a window. Inside the stage, you have a scene, which is maybe the whole window, maybe only part of the window. And then inside of a scene, you have a layout. And then inside of the layout, you have the individual items that you might want to put. And the layout determines how they're laid out inside that scene. All right, so hopefully that makes some sense. All right, so what we're going to do here is we're going to draw some basic shapes. Um, I'm going to draw a very exciting line and a very exciting circle, which I'm going to fill in because that's fancy. All right, so over in IntelliJ, what we're going to do is 
we're going to start off with what they gave us, which was the basic code. And we're just going to take a look at that. So the slide mentions what's happening here. And what you have is you have a main method, which is our main class, which is extending something called application. This is always going to be true. Your main class is going to extend application. Furthermore, your main method inside your main class is always going to magically call something called launch and pass it the arguments. Uh, the arguments are what came in to the main function, which is probably nothing. All right, why are we doing this? Because this is how JavaFX works. You are always going to override, um, um, sorry, yes, I was like, that is totally not the right thing. You are always going to extend application you are always going to call launch from your main, and then you are always going to override a method called start. Start is what gets called when the application launches, and it's what decides how the windows are built and where everything goes. So start may then call other things, but this basic structure is always going to have to be here. You're always going to extend application, you're always going to have a main method that calls launch, and you're always going to override start. What else you may do is dependent on what it is that you're trying to do. So that's a little bit goofy. I will say it's very nice that IntelliJ automatically gives you an example, so you'll never actually have to type that. You just have to start off with a JavaFX application, and you will at least have the shell that you're always going to have. So then inside of that start method, that's where we're actually going to do our thing. So you can see here, it creates a, um, a scene, and that scene is a new scene and it is 300 by 275, and it is setting the primary stage to that scene. So it creates a scene, and then it sets the stage to that scene. And then at the very end, it says show, which is what actually causes the window to pop open. If you don't call show, nothing happens. All right, so what are we gonna do here? So we always have to do this override, and you're always going to have to have a layout, and then you're going to have groups in your layouts, and so on, and so on, and so on. So what we're going to do is we are going to create a couple of new things inside of here. So um, I'm going to comment out this line, and I'll explain this line in more detail later. It's related to this, which is related to Scene Builder, which allows me to build it by dragging and dropping. I'm going to show you how that works later on in the video, but that's not relevant to what we're doing in this first example. So I'm commenting out this first line, which again was, input, was inserted by IntelliJ as a hint on how to use the magical drag and drop GUI inside of IntelliJ. All right, so um, the first thing that I'm going to do in my new method is I'm going to create a group. And so the way that I do that is I'm going to say group, I'm gonna call it root, and call it whatever you want, gets new group. And as you will notice quickly, it says, ah, that's not actually in your import list. You're going to find that as you're doing this, you're going to need a bunch of stuff added to your import list. So IntelliJ has the nice feature of um, Shift, Alt, and Enter, giving you the options. Many of these words exist in more than one thing because Swing is a different GUI method inside of Java, which we no longer use, um, but a lot of people used it in the past. So um, you will find that there's going to be a Java FX version of many of these things, and there's going to be a swing version of many of these things. And then the word group is also used in security ACLs. So you need to make sure you're including the correct thing. And there you go, it's Java scene group. Java FX scene group is what it included. All right, so what have I done so far? Well, I've created something to hold my canvas, which is the next thing that I'm going to create. And then I'm going to put this canvas into the group and then I'm going to put the group into the scene, and the scene is already in the stage, and that all makes perfect sense. All right, so let's create a canvas. So I'm going to say canvas, I'll call it canvas1, equals new canvas. I'll make it 300 by 200. All right, and again, we're going to choose JavaFX scene canvas. Great. Okay. And then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to tell it that that canvas is in a context of drawing in 2D. So I'm going to say graphics context, and I'll call it GC, you can call it whatever you want, that's a variable name, gets canvas1, which is the name of my canvas that I just made, dot get graphics context 2D. 
right? And I'm going to put in my semicolon. And I also have the same problem again. So this time we're going to I had already done that, but I guess I didn't. There we go. And so that adds in Java FX scene canvas graphics context. Okay, cool. So now I have a graphics context. Now I can actually start drawing things. So I'm going to say graphics context dot fill oval. And my oval is going to be from 1060 to 3030. These are just random numbers. I'm basically drawing a oval, which is going to be a particular shape. Um, it's going to be a circle. And that is a filled oval, which is going to have the effect of it being filled in. So it's going to be a solid oval. All right. Next up, I'm going to set a, uh, I'm going to make a line. You see dot stroke line. And I'm going to start at 40, 10, and I'm going to go to 10, 40, which is going to be a diagonal line. And again, these are values that are specified as x, y, x, y, likewise up here. Um, in this case, it's x, y, width and height is what the oval actually takes. So each one of them takes slightly different things. Um, stroke line also needs to be added. Why you no do? Uh, okay. I think I have everything I need. I have group, I have scene, I have canvas, graphics, contact, stage. Yeah, I don't think that's actually a problem. OK. All right, and then now we actually need to add our canvas to our group. I'll explain this bit in just a second. So I'm going to say root.getchildren.add canvas1. And then I'm going to change my scene to no longer be this new scene that it was a moment ago. It's now just going to be scene1 which I previously defined um, in there. Did I ever produce the scene? I never produced the scene. I apologize. It's going to be scene, scene one, new scene, root, being the group that's in there. All right, I'm going to get rid of this hello world, and I am going to ask it to build and find all of the silly things that I did wrong. All right, stroke line, int, 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 int. Cannot find symbol. Did I spell it wrong? S-T-R-O-K-E-L-A-N-E. -E. I did not. Um, why is that not working? Um, I have all the bits in there, and it was OK with fill oval. Why is it not OK with stroke line? All right. We're going to type it again just to make sure that I'm not crazy and it's line 40, 10, 10, 40. Oh, I spelled it wrong. That's why. Brilliant. That's also why it was highlighted wrong in the beginning. All right, build again. Hey, look at that. That seems like that did something. Let's run it. And what I should see is a canvas with a line and a circle. And indeed, I do. And of course, I could move those around, x and y. So I moved this over 10 and then down 60. This was the oval. That's about 60 pixels from the top, and that's about 10 pixels from the left. And then its width was 30 pixels, and its height was 30 pixels. If I bump these up to 60 wide, then you're going to get, um, you're going to get an oval, because, well, ovals are wider than they are long. So you can see what's happening there. So I'm able to draw basic shapes. Yay. Um, there are also other things I can do. Like, for example, the line has a width. So I can say GC dot set line width. And I can set it to 10. And that's going to be a much thicker line than we had just a moment ago. So that's what it looks like now. I'm going to build. And then I'm going to run. And I am going to learn to type capital letters. Um, I'm also going to learn to actually use the autocomplete. I grew up in a world where we didn't have autocomplete. Back in my day, we didn't have, okay, there we go. So you can see much thicker line, yay. Um, there's also a million options that you can do. It can be a dash line, you can have a curve line, you can have all kinds of fun things like that. So this is how you draw basic canvas shapes inside of Java. The confusing parts were you're always going to override 
um, uh, yeah, so you're I always highlight the wrong part and then get confused. You're always going to extend application that has to happen. You're always going to override start and you're always going to have this main method that calls launch. And then inside of here, the weirdness is that you're going to have multiple different layers of stuff. So in this case, I wanted a canvas. The problem with a canvas is you can't put a canvas directly into a scene. You can only put canvases into groups. So I defined a group that has nothing in it but a canvas, and then I added the group to the scene, which is permitted. So there has to be some form of a layout method. A group has no layout. It just says everything goes in the top left corner, don't care. Um, so that's why I'm using group. I could have also done a, a grid of some form and then put the um, canvas in a particular corner of the grid and then done other stuff around it if that's what I had wanted to do. So that's why I used a, um, a group called root. So I created a group. I then created a canvas. I set the canvas to 2D because there's also an option for 3D. Um, I created the lines and all of the things that are inside of the canvas. So this is where I actually did the work of drawing on the canvas. And then the last couple of lines here, I set the canvas um, to be inside of the group. And then I set the scene to look at the group, which ties the scene, the canvas to the group, to the scene, to the window, which is why you actually see it in the window. All right. So that is how we would do this in Java. Let's jump over and do the same thing in C Sharp. I'm going to pause for just a second. Uh, that is not how I pause. That's how I pause. OK, and we're back. Um, sorry about that phone call. Um, so we talked about how we would do this in Java. Um, the code that we just wrote is here on the slide if you want to copy it along. Um, and now we're going to talk about how to do that same thing in C Sharp. So over here in Visual Studio, um, when we pop into Visual Studio initially, your menus may not exactly look the same. They are wherever you last left them. Um, we're going to talk about how to use the drag and drop interface in a minute, but we're going to start off by dealing with the coding part. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to do view code instead of designer, which is where it pops you in initially. All right, so in this case, we have um, our partial class form one, uh, which is going to override or extend um, form. And that's what we're calling it here. It's a Windows form. So we have our public method for initialize. And what, we're, what I'm going to do is I'm going to override a method called paint. So I'm going to say protected override void on paint, which takes in a paint event arg, we'll call e. Okay, so on paint is a very specific method that gets called, and this is how you do manual graphic design or drawing inside of C sharp. So in here, I'm going to define um, graphics. G is going to get a new e dot graphics. So what came in as an argument is a paint event argument, and I'm making a new instance of it inside of my method so that I can interact with it. All right, inside of C Sharp, we're going to deal a lot with pens, which are um, the different kinds of brushes that we might need to use. So we have pens and we have brushes. I'm going to start off with a pen. I'm going to say pen pen one equals new pen. And this one is going to be brushes.black so that I have a black pen to draw with. Um, while I'm at it, I'm going to go ahead and make a paintbrush as well. And in that case, it's going to be a solid brush. Um, and this one is going to be called fill brush. And it's going to be a new solid brush with color black. All right, so I have made two pens, one of them is a pen and one of them is a paintbrush. I could do this multiple different ways. You can tell that color versus, um, sorry, brushes.black versus color.black. There's lots of different options for each of those and there's other things you can pass in um, and set as thicknesses and all the rest of the uh, particulars of the pens. 
but we're just going to do the same example that we did in Java. We're going to say g dot draw line, and I'm going to tell it that I want it done with my pen, and then I'm going to tell it where I want it to start and where I want it to end. 40, 10, 10, 40. This is the same idea as what we were doing in the other language. It is still indexed the same way. Those are actually the same parameters I did in the last language. And then I'm going to draw my circle. It's called a fill ellipse. And this time I'm going to use my fill brush because I want it actually filled. And I'm going to pass it 10, 60, uh, which is my location. And then likewise, 30, 30, which is my width and height. And I'm noticing that that should be 10, 1, not 10. All right, and then the last thing that we're always going to do is we're going to call our parent. Goodness, what did you just do? We're going to call our parent base dot um, on paint. I don't know why it's doing that. Stop doing that. All right, and now we're going to compile that and we are going to run it and with any bit of luck no what do i do namespace cannot directly contain numbers such as fields and that is on line 21. um let's see what am i doing wrong protected override on paint um so we have drawing we have windows forms um, yeah, did I put this in the wrong place? Oh, I totally did. I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> there we go. That's probably going to work a bit better now. Sorry about that. And run. And there we go. We get our form, has a similar line and a similar oval. And just like with the other one, if I come in here and I change its width to, I think I did 60 in the other one, and I rebuild, you will now get a wide oval instead of a long oval. So you can change them around. All right, so these are pretty basic examples. I'm just drawing a line and a circle somewhere on the screen so that you can see what is going on with the graphics mod module and in the other case with the, um, the 2D graphics module. So, there's a bunch of different options that you can pass. Um, I gave you the code of what I just wrote here. Um, so what can you actually do with these? So this is not a complete list. It's just kind of to get you started. Um, this is the Java list of methods. This is the C-sharp list of methods. I didn't list the two that I already used. So like I obviously used um, fill ellipse, and I also used draw line. And those are the C-sharp ones. I don't think they're actually listed in here. Um, and likewise over here. You'll find that for most everything, there is a stroke or a draw, which draws the outline of it. And then there is going to be a fill in both languages, which actually fills it in. So the circle that I used was a filled circle. Um, the other type of circle obviously would be a unfilled circle. Um, so if you drew ellipse, um, or I think there are two L's in ellipse, and I think that's a typo anyway. Um, and likewise over here, there is stroke oval. If I used either of those, I would get the outline. The way that they're called is ever so slightly different. And like most things I'm going to tell you, you're probably just going to need to look up each of them. So for example, if I go to stroke oval in Java FX and I pull up their documentation from the Oracle site, you're going to see that uh, one thing that's particularly odd about the oval is that you actually put a, a rectangle you use a rectangle first, and then you tell it to draw the oval inside of the rectangle. So some of them are going to be very specific about things like that. And so, um, yeah, uh, where is, where is stroke oval? There it is. Okay, so the particulars here, stroke and oval, um, Okay, well, I lied about that. It's the other language. It's not C-sharp. It's Java that requires you to do that. So let's see. Um, no, actually, I got stroke oval. Is there a stroke oval in both, or do I have this backwards? 
Um, huh. Well, that doesn't fill me with confidence. I'm going to pause for just a second and validate that I didn't mess up on the slide and put these in the wrong order. Okay, I'm just losing my mind. Yes, that was Java. I didn't, there was nothing wrong on the slide. It was correct. I just thought that this was somehow giving me documentation for C Sharp. It is not. So stroke oval indeed is Java and it just works the same as the fill one. You give it the X and Y coordinates and then you give it the height and the width. It is the C Sharp version of it. That's the weird one. So draw ellipse. Um, in order to draw an ellipse, you first define a rectangle that is the size that you want the ellipse to be, and then you simply tell it to draw an ellipse with the pen inside of the rectangle, and it fills the rectangle with the ellipse in whatever shape the rectangle happened to be. That's just strange, and it's odd that it doesn't do the same thing when you do a fill ellipse. It just does, it just takes in the four parameters as we saw. So my point of all of this is that you need to look at the documentation for each of these methods because the way that they're called is slightly different. And especially some of them allow you to draw almost arbitrary um, lines, which can have arcs in them. And this is how you would define drawing a character in a video game. You would have lots of arcs and lots of um, detail inside of there. And so you have a whole lot of parameters that you can pass in there as to how far you want the arc to span um, between two different places. Do you want a fill closed arc? or do you want it to be an open arc and so on and so on and so on. There's a million different options for each of these, but they all basically work the same way. You need a graphics context, um, which is going to be what you're actually drawing on, um, just like I did here in this example. So this is how you draw in both of the languages. The details of exactly how the methods work, you're gonna have to look them up when you go to actually call them, but you can see that this would allow you to draw an image um, there are also ones in here that directly take in actual JPEGs or GIFs. Um, there's an equivalent one over here. It is draw image. There it is. Um, so they also support the ability to load in other data into the background and then draw over it, um, which you might need to do for certain circumstances if you want to load a background image and then have your characters moving on front of the background image and so on and so forth. Um, there's also the ability to move things after you have done them and to animate them so that they're actually moving but that's beyond the scope of what we're gonna talk about here today um, because this lecture is already going to be really long and you're probably already bored. All right, so this is how you draw inside of C Sharp and inside of Java. The code for both of those are in the slides and um, hopefully you can replicate that and you should be able to do that. The other thing that you will sometimes have to do is to build a user interface where the user is going to interact. I'm gonna show a quick example of one here just so that you're on the same page as to what we're uh, talking about. But this is a typical form interface. So there's some kind of menuing over here where I can expand and contract windows. And then there are places I can type specific things in. There are radio buttons that allow me to select what it is that I'm trying to actually do. And then there are buttons that actually tell it to start. This is a very common user interface. You see it every time you try to log into something, you're gonna get a login window. You're going to get a place for your username and a place for your password and a submit button. And that's exactly what we're actually going to draw. We're going to draw a login window in both of the languages so that you can see what that looks like. This is obviously quite different than just drawing arbitrary lines because you're allowing the user to interact with the form. So that's what a form is. Let's talk about building a form in Java first with code, and then we're going to use the drag and drop form. All right. So we're going to begin in IntelliJ again, and we are going to um, start off in our main method here. And I'm going to get rid of pretty much everything that I did previously, because very little of that is going to be relevant. I'm going to get rid of all of the lines and everything that I had. And I pressed an arbitrary button, and now things are not working again. There we go. Yay. All right. So we're going to start off. And again, my goal here is to build a uh, a, um, a form that has a username and a field where you can enter your username, password, a field where you can enter your password, and then a submit button that allows you to actually submit it back and then evaluate whether the user's um, logged in correctly or not. I'm not going to do all the checking to make sure the user's is correct. That would just be string compares and whatnot in the back end. Um, I'm just going to show you how to build the UI part of it today. All right, so the first thing that we're going to need is we are going to need a layout. So this time I'm going to use a grid pane. So I'm going to say grid pane, my grid equals new grid pane. 
and that looks good. All right, um, in order for that to work, I have to include a bunch of stuff again. So we're going to get grid pane as one of our options, and that is in scene layout. Awesome. All right, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make a scene. I'm going to make a scene. Um, so scene, my scene equals new. And this time it's going to use my grid. And I'll do 500, 500 just as a random size. All right, so you'll notice that the grid that I just made is being set as the scene that I'm using. And then down at the very bottom of all of this, I'm going to set this scene on the stage to be my scene. And I'm calling show. So right now, this should actually run. Um, and I shouldn't have any problems, but I will get a blank window because there is nothing in the window because I haven't specified anything yet. But there is a layout now on my scene. Great. So next thing we're going to do is we're going to create a couple of labels. So a label, um, I'm going to call it user label. Again, just has text in it. And so this is the equivalent of a string, but in a GUI world. So I'm going to say username, and there we go. All right, label also has to be included. Uh, OK, there are possible side effects found. Yes, I'm sure there are. That's fantastic. Whatever, get on with it. Um, OK, I'm just going to go ahead and include it myself manually, because I don't want to deal with that. Import, and this one's going to be javafx.scene.control.label. And one semicolon. Awesome. Build and run. Nothing has changed because I haven't actually put the label anywhere yet, so I still have a blank window, but it does at least compile now. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and put that into my um, grid. So what I'm going to do is my grid add, and I'm going to put the user label into position 0, 0. All right. Now, with a grid, what we're doing is, again, picture a table in your mind, and you're going to have a, a rows and columns. You're going to weirdly specify the column first. That's going to trip you up. It certainly did when I was coding this as an example for the slides. Um, so you're going to specify the column index and then the row index. So by saying 0, 0, because it is indexed, I'm putting it in the top left corner. So at this point, if I build and I run, I'm going to see my label, which says username, and it's all the way in the top left corner of my grid, which is exactly where I would want it. Why am I using a grid? Because over here, I'm going to have the box where they actually type in their username, and then I'm going to have the, pa the word password, and I'm going to have them type in their password, and then I'm going to have a submit button. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. So I'm going to go ahead and make the label for the password. So I'm going to call it pass label. Um, or password label, and this time I'm going to ask them for their password. And I'm going to add that into my grid. This time I'm going to add it in as column number zero, but row number one, because I want it below the other one. All right, so I should have both labels. There they are. And you're thinking, wow, you printed text on the screen. This is so cool. Yeah, OK. All right, so the next thing that we need is we need a input box for them to actually type in their answers. So I'm just going to keep these things together. So this time I'm going to call it text field, and I'm going to call it user text area. I'm going to say new text field. And likewise, I'm going to use another one, which is called password field, password text area equals new password. Both of these work pretty much the same way. The difference between a text field and a password field is that a text field does not hide what you're typing, whereas a password field does hide what you're typing. I need to include both of these. One is called text field, and the other one is called password field. And it has a capital F. That's why it's highlighting that weirdly. Cool. All right, and I'm going to go ahead and add them in to my grid. So my grid dot add. This one is going to be user, PA, which is my user text area. 
and I'm going to put that into column one, which is to the right of column zero in row zero. And then I'm going to put the password one, which I called password PA into column one, row one. And we're going to build and we're going to run. No, we're not. We're going to put in a semicolon somewhere. Really? You think that I would know to put in semicolons? Hey, look at that. Go me. Okay, so now we have a username and a field where they can type and a password. And just to show the difference, if I type in Enda up here, you see the word Enda. The password field, when I type in Enda, you don't see it. You just see the dots in order to imply that a character has been typed, but you can't see what they are. So that's the difference between the text field and a password field in this particular case. All right. So the last thing that I need is I need a button that actually does a submit. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say button submit uh, button equals new button. And the text I want on the button is submit me. Maybe log me in. All right, and where I'm going to put that is I'm going to put it into my grid. And I'm going to put that into column one, row two, because I want it down below the other two. Um, and in order to do that, I need buttons, which is, as you notice, every one of these has its own separate library. Um, There's my log me in button. Cool. OK, so this does nothing. I can type it does nothing. Because all I've done is I've defined how it looks. This is how UIs usually get coded. You start off by figuring out where you want all the bits and how you want them to look. And then you deal with the fact that when they press this button, you're going to actually need to do something. So we're going to talk about how to deal with that in just a second. Um, there are a couple of things that immediately strike me as being weird about that particular layout. You wouldn't normally see this all in the top left corner. It would be nicer if this was in the middle of the screen. So how do I go about doing that? Well, um, the grid actually takes a couple of properties, which will make life a little bit easier. So when I define the grid up here, I'm going to do my grid dot set alignment to position dot center. And that has the effect of moving it all the way over to the center of the screen. And position center requires geometry position is what it requires. It would be nice enough and actually allow me to do this. Uh, no. Well, maybe. Yes, it did. Awesome. Go automated things. OK. Yes, I would like to stop and rerun. Hey, look at that. That looks like an actual login form. So now the only other thing I would say is it's kind of annoying that these boxes are right on top of each other. Normally, if you've seen a login form, there'd be some space in between them. And this being right below is a bit clumpy as well. So we're going to put in a little bit of space here. So I'm going to say my grid dot um, set vertical gap uh, 10. And we're going to build. We're going to run. And you see how it used to look. And now when I rerun it, yay, there's spaces in between them. So that's a pretty good looking form. Um, I have done everything that I needed to do there. All right, so that's how we do it in uh, Java. So where is the slides? There they are. Um, you're going to find that is the code that I did just a moment ago. and. I did put in a comment here because we're going to fill out a little bit more information in a moment. And when you have written that information later in the video, it's going to go where that comment is. That's going to be important to you later. All right. We could have also done this a different way. And there is a much easier way to do all of this. I mentioned before that there's this thing called Scene Builder. And in, um, in, in IntelliJ, you can also do things by simply dragging and dropping. So I'm going to do something similar. I'm going to say grid pane, 
I'm going to drag it out here. And you notice that it immediately gives me a grid. And then under controls, I'm going to go down and I'm going to find a label. And I'm going to drag the label over into here. And I'm going to drag another label into here. Eek. Now, <laughs> don't know why it's being like that, but anyway. Um, and then we would have text areas. So basically what it's allowing me to do, text fields, text areas are bigger than text fields. Um, what it's allowing me to do is it's allowing me to actually drag and drop things and it's building that same interface that I was building before. And then over on the right, there are properties. So I would type in username. And on this one, I would type in password. And you get the general idea. Over here, I would give this a name, um, which it's right now named um, text1. Um, I can see the code for each of the things. So I can see its ID. I can see all the various methods that get fired when I put stuff in there, and so on and so forth. So I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on this because it seems pretty obvious. You drag and drop the various bits in there. Each of the things has properties. When you click on the grid, you get properties for it. When you click on a label, you get properties for the label. At any time, it tells you what you're looking at up in the top right-hand corner. And you can absolutely build the same interface that we just built the other way. Does it make you less of a programmer to use this? No, not really. It's just a convenience thing. When you're dragging and dropping, sometimes it's easier to see how it's going to be laid out. In the end, it's actually writing the same code in the back end for you. If you're going to use the drag and drop, this line has to be turned on. Um, with it turned off, everything that I'm doing over there is irrelevant. It's not actually using it. Um, I'm only using the, um, the one that I built. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense to you. That's the other method for doing things where you would drag and drop them into the appropriate places. Um, if we go over to, oh, we're going to do the event handler first. Okay, so in our code here, we have all of the looks of what we're supposed to have, but this button does absolutely nothing. So again, I'm not going to code an entire actual login. That's not relevant to what we're going to do here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to have a piece of text pop up at the bottom that tells you the name that's typed into that box, and it says that they're going to try and log in. So the way that that's going to be done is on this button, I'm going to set an event handler. And I'm going to say, when an action happens here, I'm going to want it to do some specific stuff. All right, so the first thing that I'm going to do is a little bit non-intuitive, which is below all of this in my grid, I'm going to add in a, um, an additional um, text area that's going to have nothing in it. So I'm going to do this right up here. I'm going to say, um, what am I going to say? I am going to say label. Um, label. What did I call this? I think I called it. I'm trying to remember what it says in the slide. Sorry. Um, text. Oh, I'm using it as actual text. OK, so I'm, the difference between text and a label is minor. It's just a different way to lay things out. So I'm just going to say action target is new text. All right trying to be consistent so you end up with the same code and you can see that it does actually work. Um, so it was text action target um, equals new text, right? And that has nothing in it. I'm not setting the text to anything at the moment. So okay, so that turns that on. And I'm going to add that to the grid. I'm going to put action target into 1, 6. Just putting it all the way down at the bottom. As a matter of fact, I've, no, I've put nothing past row 2 at the moment. And now magically, I'm putting something in row 6. It understands that that means that the other rows are all just going to be blank. All right, so that's nothing magical. That's just me putting some text down at the bottom of the screen. And again, I could have done it with a label. It would have worked the same. I just happened to use text for whatever reason. Um, so next, what I'm going to do is I'm going to define what happens when the button is pressed. So let's review. We have a button that is called Submit Button. And right now, there's nothing magical about Submit Button. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say Submit Button dot set on action. And then 
I'm going to have a new event handler action. All right. And you note that when I tabbed that complete, it went ahead and put in the override for the handle taking in the event. This is what's always going to happen. Nothing here is particularly magical. That's why it can auto fill all of this. You are always going to have an override of handle, which is how you are handling this event. The event that's happening, the action that's happening is coming in as a particular type of action, which in this case is going to be the button that was pressed. There are many different actions that can happen to things. So with radio buttons, they can select something or they can unselect something. In checkboxes, they can check or uncheck. In the case of sliders, they can move it left, move it right, they can let go, they might be able to double click. So there may be different events that can handle, that can be handled. And you will write separate code to handle each of those different kinds of events in here. You'll say, if it's this kind of event, I want to do this. If it's that kind of event, I want to do that. Um, we're going to have a whole section on event handling, so don't worry about that too much. But I do want you to get the general idea that this is how you would go about coding it. So what I'm doing here is I'm going to use action target, which you'll remember was my block of text, which right now is blank. And I'm going to change it to action target dot set text. And what I'm going to set it to is I'm going to get the text out of the username box. So I'm just going to run this again so you can see the window. So to review, oh, of course, it won't let me run it right now because I'm in the middle of typing. Um, to review, well, here we can cheat and we can do it over here in the C Sharp window. No, we haven't done it in C Sharp yet. Bugger. All right. Um, there was a username and there was a password, and each of them had a box. And what I'm going to do is take the text that whatever the user typed into the username box, and I'm going to write that on the screen. So how do I get to that text? Well, that text is in this text field up here, which is called user TA. So I'm going to say, I want you to set the text of this new label to user TA dot get text. I'm saying here is reach into that field, which is a text field, and pull out the text for me. And that returns to me a string. And now the rest of it is the words attempted to sign in so that I get something that's nice and clean on the screen. All right. Does that mean that I didn't do something dumb? The world should compile. And I did. Action target can't find because I probably typoed it as I always do. Nope. What happened is I defined it after I used it, which is not very smart. Hey, look at that. Now it's happy. Yeah, you can't just magically use a variable you haven't defined yet. Turns out it's picky about that. Who knew? All right, so we're back to my same form. I'm going to type in Enda, and then I'm going to type in my password, which of course is some nonsense. And now I'm going to hit this button. When I hit this button, what is going to happen is this button is called Submit Button, and Submit Button has Onset Action, Event Handler, Handle. It's going to change this block of text, which is down here right now and is currently blank. It's in row number six. Remember, that's where I put it. I put it in column one, row six. Um, but it's currently blank. So when I press this button, it's going to change the text in this field down here to say, and attempted to sign in. Okay, so hopefully you can see that that's the general idea of how you would write a handler. The handler takes an event. The event in this case is a click of the button, and it runs whatever code you tell it to run to do whatever it is that you want it to do. Of course, I could have done a million things in here. This is just an example so that you can see it. Um, that it's printing something out on the screen so that you can actually see what's happening. All right. So that is my event handler. That is how you would do all of this in Java. So the next question is, of course, how do we do all of the same stuff in C Sharp? And the answer to that question is, it's going to be a lot easier because, well, again, it's just easier in C Sharp. So what I'm going to do is I am going to go to the designer window. And I'm going to bring back up all of the um, all of the um, windows that I need. So I'm going to turn on all of these different things. Um, the one that I want is the object browser. And what else do I want? I need code window, the class view. I had all these turned on earlier. All right. Call hierarchy. I don't think I need that one, but I have it now just in case I do. Okay, so here is my form. And you can move that window because it's totally in the way. I'm going to pause and get this into a sane state and then I'm going to come back to you. 
I have to do that in this window. Okay. Um, really what I needed to do was hit stop on the program so that I got back to the correct view. I don't know why it was being so weird. All right, so um, what we have over here on the left is the uh, toolbox with the common controls. And literally the way that you do this is all with drag and drop. You can code it manually if you want to, but there's really no reason to in C, uh, C Sharp. So uh, what I told you to do over here is you're gonna start by dragging a panel from the toolbox onto the form. So we're gonna scroll down until we find panel. There we go, I'm gonna drag that over here. And that gives me a panel. I can make that a little bit bigger, life is good. Now I'm gonna do a couple of labels. So I'm gonna grab label one and label two. It does give you some lines that tell you that things are lining up correctly. And I'm going to need some um, text boxes, um, which are called, they're not called text boxes, are they? They are, they're called text boxes, go figure. So there's one. And there's two, and then I need a button, and that's gonna go in here somewhere. Cool, okay, now I need to actually set all of the attributes to what I want them to. So I'm gonna click on the first thing, and over in my attribute window, I have a name, and I have some text for a label. With a label, it doesn't really matter. So my text here is going to be username, colon, and then I'm gonna click on label number two, and I'm going to make that password colon. So life is good there. For my input field, the name does matter um, because the name is what I'm going to refer to that input field as in the actual code. So um, we're going to call this username um, randomly. And then there's nothing else that I need to do for this one because that is just a text box. You can obviously change everything that's in here, including the colors, the background colors, if there's default text in there, the location, all the, how thick the line is, if it's dashed, if it's dotted, and all of those millions of things that you can do. Um, this guy we're going to call password. There is no text field versus password field in C Sharp. The way that you do that is there's an attribute called password character, which you can set to a star. And now when they're typing in their password, instead of it showing the actual character, it shows a star because that field is set. Um, all right, so that should all pretty much work. So we're gonna do build, and then we're going to try and run it. And I still have my canvas up there, but that's fine. Um, so I should be able to type in Enda, and down here, if I type in my password, you see that you get lots of stars like you would expect. If I press this button, absolutely nothing happens because I haven't told it what to do. Okay. So how do we go about doing um, code on the button? Well, over in, um, this is the design window, over in the text window, and if you can't get to that normally, you can come in here under view and choose code or design. Um, I'm going to add a, um, a method to deal with my button um, click, which I would have expected it to put the default one in there, but it didn't. I don't really know why. There we go. All right, so if I double click on it, it goes ahead and fills in, hey, you're probably going to want to write an event handler for this, so let me go ahead and give you the code. Very nice of it. So I'm gonna do the same thing as I did before, which is I'm going to put another hidden block of text down here. So how do I do that in this case? I'm gonna drag another label over here, and this time I'm going to give this label a name because I'm gonna to need to be able to overwrite it. What I'm gonna call it is um, uh, let's call it response. And I'm going to set its text, which right now says label three, to nothing, which has it basically disappear. It's still there, and if you need to get back to it, because it'll hide, because there's nothing there, if you tab, you'll eventually get back to it. So I'm just in the box and I'm tabbing around to get to the various places. Cool. Okay, so to be clear, what's happening is when they press this button, I'm going to want it to take the text out of here, and what I called this was username, and I'm going to want to write it into response, which is what's down at the bottom. So back over to my code window, I'm going to create a string. I'm going to call result, and I'm going to say it gets username.text, that is the answer that was in the text box, plus literal string attempted to log in just so that it works the same as the Java example. And then finally I set response 
dot text equals to my result, which is what I just calculated right above. So this is that um, this is that label, which is called response, which currently is empty, and I'm setting the text of that label equal to this string. And this string is simply made up by taking something out of the username box and adding in this literal string to it. All right, we're going to build, and we're going to hit run, and I'm going to type in Enda and something into the password, and I'm going to hit the button, and it says Enda attempted to log in just like the other one. Um, and obviously you could move around all of those things. You could put this up at the top. You can put background colors on it. You can do a million other things, but I just wanted you to see at least one example of where you would interact with a form and have it put some information somewhere on the screen so that you can see it. Okay, so that explains how you do it. That explains the event handler, which I just typed, and that concludes everything that I have for you today. So. To review, what did we cover today? We covered how to draw random shapes and um, lines and ovals and arcs and all of that fun stuff on a canvas or on a graphics object inside of both Java and in C Sharp. And then we talked about how to build a form using both the code methods in Java and also the builder method in Java. And then finally, using the Windows Forms design method inside of C Sharp and then filling in some code. Um, so again, you will have noticed in this video that every time I talked about the C sharp stuff, it's just easier. It really is. Like I, I don't mean to be to be mean. It is easier mostly because it is simpler. It's not having to deal with all the other operating systems. It is a definitive thing that if you're writing C sharp code, it's running on a Windows desktop. So therefore, they don't have to deal with a lot of the other stuff. That's why you end up having to trip through a few more things when you're dealing in Java because it's a more generalized system. Um, hopefully that all makes sense. If you guys have any questions, always happy to pop into office hours and um, happy to answer any questions that you have. You're going to get practice doing this in your lab next week, so that will give you an opportunity to actually uh, code some of this, and you may end up needing to come back and take a look again at this example. So I hope you guys are having a fantastic week. Again, halfway through the semester, you guys are surviving well. Um, I will see you next week when we're going to talk about some new fun stuff. You guys have a great week. Bye now.